Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is John Delaney, and I'm the commission's designated presiding officer for this hearing. With me are Commissioner David Clark and Commissioner John Harvey. Today is April 11th, 2024. It's approximately 9 a.m., and this is the time and place that has been noticed for the hearing to consider the settlement stipulation in docket 23-057-16. Which is the joint application of Questar Company, DBA, Dominion Energy Utah, and Enbridge Quail Holdings, LLC, for approval of the proposed sale of Fall West Hold Co., LLC, to Enbridge Quail Holdings, LLC. Okay. Why don't we start with appearances, please, for the applicants. Thank you so much. My name is Jennifer Clark. I'm counsel for Dominion Energy, and I have with me speaking on behalf of the company, Kelly Mendenhall. We also have Judd Cook with us in case the commission has questions for him. Thank you. Brian Burnett, I'm counsel for uh, Amperage Quail Holdings, LLC. With me, I have uh, witnesses Christopher Johnston, James Sanders, and Laszlo Borsani. Uh, Michelle Herodence is not here today. I've contacted the Commission and parties, and she's available for questions by telephone if, uh, if, if needed, if the other witnesses are not able to answer those questions. Okay. Thank you. Um, I guess for the division. Thank you. Patricia Schmid, Assistant Attorney General, and Patrick Grecu, also an Assistant Attorney General. The division's witness today is Mr. Eric Orton. The other division witness who filed testimony, Mr. Casey Coleman, is out of state at a work-related conference. He is available by telephone if there are questions that Mr. Orton cannot answer. We would be happy to contact him and have him up here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for the Office of Consumer Services. Uh, yes, this is Robert Moore of the AG's office representing the Office of Consumer Services. With me today is Jacob Zachary, a utility analyst at the office, and he'll be our witness today. Thank you very much. And for the intervener? Yes, Philip Russell on behalf of the Utah Association of Energy Users. We have uh, our witness, Mr. Kevin Higgins, is available and in the hearing room, I believe. Thank you. Great. Is anybody, uh, any other party making an appearance today? So no Idaho? Okay, I didn't think so, but I thought I'd just clarify. Okay, um, so a few preliminary matters before we get going. I, I want to begin with reminding everybody that we have a public witness hearing this evening scheduled at 5 p.m. It's scheduled to be in this room, so uh, we will convene uh, a little before five tonight to see if um, anybody from the public would like to uh, say what they'd like to say. The other preliminary matter is that uh, with respect to confidential information, and many of you probably get tired of hearing this from me, but um, we know that there's at least one piece of confidential information that's been filed in this docket, and I'm not sure if the parties are planning on offering any testimony relating to that piece of confidential information. But if they are, I want to just remind everybody that this is a, an open public proceeding and that if we get to a position that confident, information that's deemed confidential by the party is going to be offered, that we address that well in advance to do what you would propose to do with that confidential information. Is that okay? All right. So why don't we begin? Um, we do have a couple of preliminary, preliminary matters as well. Oh, great. Please. Thank you. First, um, paragraph three of the settlement stipulation calls for the admission of all the pre-filed testimony and exhibits. And once again, the company would move on that basis for the admission of the joint application, all of the accompanying exhibits and accompanying testimony. So are you doing that by way of stipulation, or are you making a motion? I'm making a motion. Okay. If you, the, the technical words in the stipulation indicate that we agree they should be admitted, so I am moving for their admission. Okay, so the motion is to include the settlement stipulation as part of what is otherwise stipulated to in the... 
I'll, sorry, re I'll restate, restate it. it. Yeah, I'm sorry. The company would move for the admission of the joint application along with all of the accompanying exhibits and testimony. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I misunderstood. Okay. Um, for the division, uh, what is your response to the motion? The division supports the motion. Okay. And for the office? No objection. Okay. Mr. Russell? No objection, although I do think it might be worth um, a conversation with the scope. Did, are, you, are you moving for the admission of all of the pre-filed testimony or just the testimony that accompanied the application? I'm moving just on behalf of the joint applicants. Okay. No, no objection either way. Just wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page about what's been admitted and not what hasn't. Okay. Thank you very much for that uh, clarifying question. Your motion is unopposed is granted. Thank you so much. Our second motion, you will notice in the binders before you that there are two hearing exhibits, hearing exhibits 13 and 14, <coughs> um, and they both represent Moody's reports that have been recently issued. We've spoken with the parties and um, understand that there is no opposition to the admission of those as hearing exhibits, and the joint applicants' witnesses will speak to them briefly. So we would move for the admission of those two documents as well. Okay, so the motion is for the uh, admission of what is designated as DEU Enbridge Hearing Exhibit 13.0 and 14.0, correct? That's correct. And that's for the record uh, referring to the document, uh, the uh, trial binder. No. And for the uh, division, your response? No objection. Thank you. Mr. Moore. No objection. All right. Mr. Russell. No objection. Okay, thank you. Your motion is granted. Thank you so much. We have no additional preliminary matters. Thank you. Uh, do any other parties have any preliminary matters they'd like to address? Hearing none, why don't we proceed? Thank you so much. The company calls Kelly B. Mendenhall. Good morning, Mr. Mendenhall. Do you swear to tell the truth? Thank you. Please proceed, Council. Thank you so much. Mr. Mendenhall, would you state your full name and business address for the record? Sure. My name is Kelly Mendenhall, Kelly B. Mendenhall, and my address is 333 South State Street, Salt Lake City, Utah. And what position do you hold with Dominion Energy, Mr. Mendenhall? I'm the Director of Regulatory and Pricing. Did you participate in the preparation of the application and accompanying exhibits in this matter? I did. And did you also participate in settlement discussions and the drafting of the settlement stipulation we're here to discuss today? Yes. Can you please summarize that settlement stipulation? Sure. Uh, I'd like to start off by, uh, maybe if I can have you turn to attachment one of the, of the settlement stipulation. I'm going to spend most of my time in there. That's the commitment matrix uh, that's, that's included as, at the end of the stipulation. While you're turning there, I'll just say I, we appreciate uh, there's a lot of work that went into this stipulation, a lot of thought, uh, even a little bit of creativity at times, but uh, I think it's a good combination, uh, creativity. So it's a, it's a combination of uh, a lot of the safeguards that were included last time when Dominion and, and Questar merged. And then uh, additionally, there are quite a few uh, new commitments that provide some net benefits to customers. So I just wanted to quickly walk through the commitments um, and give you a little bit of extra color on some of them because they're new. Um, so if we can start with commitment 1A, that just basically says that uh, going forward, uh, Quest or Gas is um, doing business as name will be Ambridge Gas Utah. Uh, 1B is a new commitment. Basically, it's just saying that if there's a change of control, uh, the company will request commission approval. And if there is a, a transaction of a portion of the company greater than 10%, the commission will be notified. Uh, provision number two, it's very simple. Uh, it will continue to be a separate legal entity and, and located in Salt Lake City. Uh, paragraph three will continue to be locally managed and have access to the necessary resources to provide safe and reliable service. Paragraph four uh, will we'll continue to be subject to the regulation by the commission and will continue to honor the existing laws, rules, and regulations. Paragraph five uh, talks about uh, management uh, will be available and books and records will be available. 
uh, to regulators. Paragraph six talks about uh, just the discovery process. We'll continue to provide information to interveners uh, like we always have. Paragraph seven uh, is really focused on WexPro. So uh, 7A uh, will continue to uh, comply with all the agreement stipulations and guideline letters of the WexPro agreement. I think that's important for uh, you know, both the company and, and the regulators. It's been a good, uh, a good agreement uh, over, over time and, and we, we see the value of it going forward. 7B is a, is a new provision so uh, there was a request that, that we provide a little bit of additional transparency uh, in our integrated resource, resource filings, uh, regor, integrated resource plan filings um, related to supply source. And, uh, you know, we, we get gas supply from WexPro as well as we purchase it out on the open market. WexPro is obviously a little easier to know where it comes from because we know the wells. Uh, a lot of the gas purchases come, are, are purchased on interstate pipelines, but we have a general idea of, of where those are from. And we actually provided uh, as an overview of this in our February 15th technical conference this year on pages 20 and 21. So it gives that, that gives the commission kind of a little uh, preview of what to expect in terms of this commitment going forward uh, in our integrator resource plan. Uh, provision number eight talks about the communications plan. And we have the benefit, uh, as you know, there are three utilities that are part of this transaction. Uh, East Ohio actually closed on March 7th, and so they're, uh, they're ahead of us. And, and I've seen their, their marketing plan, and, and I would assume ours will be similar. But um, Enbridge is very thoughtful and, and measured in their approach, and so... Uh, they, they want to have multiple channels and multiple touch points with the customer um, so that there's no surprises when that customer gets their Enbridge bill. So there, there won't be an Enbridge bill the, the next day after the closing. They're, they're, gonna, they're going to take some time to, to uh, educate customers and, and give customers an opportunity to understand uh, the transaction and how it's occurred. So. Um, we have committed that we will share with the division office that plan and give them periodic updates as that plan rolls forward. Paragraph 9, uh, there's a lot here. Um, the two things I really want to focus on are 9A Romanet I, which says that we will uh, modify the energy assistance fund language in Section 803 of our Utah tariff to exclude Idaho customers. So maybe I can just give a little background on that. So... Um, you'll see later, and I'll talk about a low-income provision that, that we're, uh, we're going to roll out for Utah customers. And as we discussed the Energy Assistance Fund, uh, the Idaho Public Service Commission staff was involved in those discussions. And, and based on those discussions, uh, we came to, to realize that it's very difficult for Idaho customers to participate in this program. Uh, we have about 2,500 customers in Idaho. And in order to, to receive the credit with the Energy Assistance Program, these customers have to be qualified by the Utah Department of Workforce Services. And that's where it becomes a little challenging. If you're an Idaho customer, how do you get the Department of Utah Department of Workforce Services to, to validate um, your situation? So we talked about uh, various uh, ideas, uh, you know, how to, I think all the parties agree that, you know, that's, that's not very equitable. Uh, and so the, the ultimate outcome, we decided the best outcome would be just to uh, propose to remove Idaho customers from that, that surcharge altogether. Um, so upon closing, we will file with the commission to make a tariff change uh, along those lines. 9C talks about, these are a couple of uh, what I would, I would deem to be customer benefits uh, related to the infrastructure replacement tracker. Uh, C, uh, C Romanet I talks about um, the fact that we will not propose to increase the level of, of recovery. Uh, it'll, it'll continue just like it is in the tariff today where it's, it's adjusted annually for inflation, but in the next two rate cases, the company will not propose to increase that cap above you know, normal, normal inflation levels. Um, so that's one benefit. In double Romanet I, uh, we've also agreed that we will uh, include in our next uh, filing in the fall 
a $275,000 credit. And we'll keep that in place for years. So ultimately, well, that, what that will do is, is give customers a, uh, a $275,000 credit. The nice thing about this particular mechanism is it applies to all classes. So it's an elegant way for all customers that we serve uh, to, to benefit from this customer credit. Provision 10 uh, says and talks about goodwill. We will not include that in, in rates going forward. 11 talks about transaction costs. Those won't be included in rates going forward. Uh, 12 just talks about for accounting purposes, we will continue to reflect assets at historical costs and customers will be held harmless for any changes in income taxes as a result of this transaction. Paragraph 15 talks a little bit about um, we have a, there will be a transition services agreement between Enbridge and Dominion going forward uh, where some of those what you call them corporate functions will continue to be provided for Dominion or by Dominion until a transition can be made and as part of that um, after a year period there's a 10% administrative fee that will be charged on top of that from Dominion to Enbridge and after two years it goes up to 20% so what uh, provision 13b is saying is that any of those surcharges will not be included in for rate making purposes those will be uh, removed uh, provision C so in in the technical conference there was a fair amount of discussion about corporate costs and, and how are we going to to hold customers harmless for any potential increases in customer costs and so I think this is this is our solution to that and what this does is it sets a baseline O&M per customer amount um, of $125.89 and the detail of that calculation is shown in attachment one of, of this exhibit uh, but bottom line is we'll we'll set that as the baseline um, we will adjust for inflation every year, but as we go on for rate cases, the, two, the ne next two rate cases will track that. And uh, to the extent that those, those costs are above that O&M per customer cap um, and, and they're caused by this transaction, uh, those costs will not be included in, in rates. Uh, provision number 14, we'll just continue to file our affiliate transaction report. Provision 15 uh, will continue to provide an audit trail of, of allocated costs and, and will continue to follow commission prior orders. Uh, you know, costs that have been denied recovery will continue to, to be denied recovery. Uh, provision number 16 basically just says we'll follow our section 206 of our tariff that deals with uh, intercompany charges and, and goods and services, um, making sure that they're fair. Provision 17 talks about uh, charitable contributions. So the way that Dominion currently provides charitable contributions is kind of through two buckets. One is just your traditional uh, you know, writing of a check to a charity. Uh, and, and in 2022, our budgeted amount for that was $1.4 million. And then there's a second portion, which is... Uh, it works kind of like a, a charitable trust or a restricted assets where um, there's a certain amount of, of money kept in restricted assets and to the extent those assets provide a return, that return is given to uh, the various universities and colleges in the state as well as a couple of arts organizations. And so historically, Dominion has managed that trust or those restricted assets. Um, I think going forward, it's been determined that we don't want to be in that business anymore. And, and these these organizations are very good at managing their own endowments. And so uh, I think the plan would be to liquidate those assets and give those assets to the, the respective organizations so that they can do what they what they want to. Um, I will say in this uh, provision, it says approximately three million. I checked, and as of the end of March, uh, that number is about $4 million. So markets had a good few months, I guess. So um, that's the plan, is, is after closing, those, those assets would be liquidated to their respective organizations, and, and that, those, that uh, those restricted assets would no longer be held by us. Uh, provision 17B 
um, talks about promotion of energy assistance costs. So uh, we have an energy assistance program, which I mentioned earlier. And over the last few years, we've had a challenge getting participation. And so we thought um, this would be a good use of funds to spend $225,000. This will be of shareholder costs to promote this program so that those who really need it uh, or know about it and, and are able to participate. And then to be equitable to Idaho, uh, we've also included in here a $2,000 charitable contribution to a charity in Franklin County. And so we'll work with uh, our folks who, who know that area well uh, to determine where those funds should could best be used. Provision 18 uh, basically just says we'll continue to have the capital necessary to invest in infrastructure to, to have a safe and reliable system. And on page three of Judd Cook's testimony, uh, you, I think he provides the five-year uh, expected capital spend uh, for, for our company. Moving on to paragraph 19. Uh, Dominion, or sorry, Enbridge will implement its integrator management system. I think we talked about that quite a bit at the technical conference, and they'll do that within two years. Paragraph 20, Questar Gas will continue to file its IRP on an annual basis. 21, we'll continue to uh, follow our interchangeability Wobi indices for uh, gas supply. Uh, 22, uh, thermwise.com will be under local control. Um, there's been some concerns raised in the past, uh, currently, well, not currently, but uh, in the past, the, that website has been managed uh, by the corporate office, and so getting changes made um, took, took some time and sometimes were difficult to make, um, so this would move through the thermwise.com website to be locally controlled, and actually, we've, we've already done this, um, and uh, just to give you an example, as we were working with the Idaho Commission, they noticed on the Thermwise website, we talk about Utah rebates, but Idaho's nowhere to be found. And so we were able to change the website to say Utah and Idaho, and we were able to do that in a day. So um, that, that should be a, a good process going forward. Uh, customer satisfaction. Uh, that is in provision 23, and I, you'll notice there there is a D and an E, but no A, B, or C. I think that's just a typo. Uh, but basically what this is saying is, and maybe I can just talk a little bit about how we did this last time. So this is very similar to the commitment last time. So we, we, we track these customer service metrics every month. And um, what we were able to do is, is get meet with the office and division and kind of look at where the metrics were. We, we want to ensure that you know, our customers are, are the customer service stays at, at good levels. Um, and these, I'm talking about things like, you know, response time or percentage of call or emergency calls responded to within uh, an hour or percentage of meters read every month or... Uh, wait times on calls, these, these types of service metrics. So we were able to meet with the office and division and kind of come up with, okay, the, these would be good kind of baseline metrics that we can measure against. And then quarterly, we reported the results of those metrics through the 2019 rate case. Um, and then we stopped reporting them because um, that was, through the commitment was through the rate case. We still track them. We've tracked them since 2019, so we know what those metrics are um, and what they'll be going forward. And so the plan is to, to do this process once again. We'll meet with the division office. We'll, we'll set those metrics, and then uh, we will report quarterly uh, to the commission on, on how those are going. Provision number 24 is kind of an overview of some of the ring fencing provisions, which I'll get into in more detail um, down below. So 20, uh, 25 basically says we will not push down debt or other financing costs. Uh, to customers, so obviously there's some capital necessary to for for this acquisition acquisition to take place that will not be pushed down to customers. Uh, Twenty six is is talking about investment grade ratings. Um, we'll, we'll, the company will strive to keep those. Uh, we'll will receive funding to meet our op ongoing operational needs. Um, we'll have our own debt. Uh, and then 26D is kind of a, 
confusing provision. I'll just give you a little bit of background on that one. So this was in the last proceeding, but this actually, this language goes all the way back to when Questar was created um, many years ago. And the, the, basically what it's trying to, to, to uh, protect against is for, let's say, the parent company goes out and it issues debt at 4%. And then it lends money down to the affiliate at four and a half percent. That's a nice little arbitrage uh, opportunity for the for the corporation. So what this provision is meant to do is say, you will charge uh, your your subsidiary the lower of what you paid or you know what what market is. So it's it that basically eliminates that that ability to arbitrage. So that's what D is trying to to explain. Uh, I know people wanted to change that, and I wouldn't let them because it uh, was written a long time ago, and it's, it's confusing, but um, we wanted to, to continue. Provision 27 says we'll still can have access to short-term debt. Paragraph 28, uh, we'll have our own separate long-term debt, as I mentioned, with our own debt ratings. 29, we'll have our own bank accounts. 30, we'll continue to, to follow the, uh, the law on on dividend notices, and we'll strive to maintain capital structure between 48 and 55 percent. Paragraph 31, the special bankruptcy director will continue. Paragraph 32, we'll provide prompt notice to the commission if we have any bankruptcy petitions. Um, 33 and 34 are employee protections, so uh, co employees' compensation will be held constant for the next 24 months. And then employees will be offered opportunities to learn and share best practices and give, be given opportunities within the greater uh, Enbridge company. Paragraph 35 uh, just talks about Enbridge's commitment to exploring and implementing clean energy projects. And then finally, the integration, integration progress report in paragraph 36. So we will... Uh, provide quarterly reports that talk about all of these provisions that we've discussed um, and the status of them. And this says we'll file our first one uh, for the year ended 2024 and we'll, we'll continue those through our second general rate case. So that uh, I think is a, is a good summary of, of where we're at on this stipulation. Mr. Mendenhall, are you familiar with what we previously referenced in this hearing as DEU Enbridge Hearing Exhibit 14.0? I am. Could you please describe that exhibit and perhaps give some insight as to why it has been offered? Yeah, so we had our technical conference in December. I, I believe it was the 7th of December, and we, we had a lot of discussion, as you'll remember, about uh, credit ratings. And, and since that time... Um, Sorry, this book is a little difficult to work with. Uh, since that time, we've we've received a couple of uh, credit rating reports. So you asked me about 14, correct? I did. Okay. So 14 is a credit opinion from Moody's on Questar Gas Company, and they had downgraded us um, to BAA1. And... We've, we have we had a discussion, um, you know, with the office and division. We wanted to be totally transparent. So I'll be honest with you. I don't, I don't think this credit report really um, is in play in this proceeding, but we wanted you to be aware of it because it's happened since, since the technical conference. So to give you just a high-level overview of, of what caused the downgrade, and maybe the best place to do that, if you turn to page one uh, of – hearing exhibit 14 there's a paragraph called recent events and i'll just read that it says on on february 23rd 2020 it says 2023 but it should be 2024 we downgraded the long-term ratings of questar gas to ba1 from a3 due to a higher level of debt required by its regulatory approved capital structure in utah the company's primary jurisdiction so as you remember in our rate case our, our approved capital structure went from 55 percent down to 51 percent Obviously, if you're at 51% equity, your leverage is higher, which, which from a credit rating standpoint makes you more risky. Uh, but the next paragraph is really what I wanted to focus on. So it says the action was not related to its expected acquisition by Enbridge. 
We believe that Enbridge will support the utility's credit and the Questor Gas will benefit from Enbridge's size, operational track record, and access to capital. And as such, Questor Gas's rating continues to be based upon its intrinsic credit quality, which is derived mostly from the Utah regulatory environment and its standalone financial profile. Mr. Mendenhall, would the approval of this transaction be just and reasonable in result and also in the public interest? Yes, it would. Mr. Mendenhall is available for cross-examination and commission questions. Thank you very much. Uh, for the division, any questions for Mr. Mendenhall? No questions. Thank you. Mr. Moore? Uh, no questions, thank you. Okay. Mr. Russell, any questions for Mr. Mendenhall? No, no questions, thank you. Commissioner Clark, any questions? Um, yes, I have a few questions, thanks. Good morning, Mr. Mendenhall. Good morning. Uh, my first question relates to commitment number one, and in particular the aspect of that commitment that uh, provides flexibility for reorganization within the Enbridge Inc. family of companies. That caused me to think, is, is Enbridge Inc. bound by the covenants and commitments in the, that are in the stipulation? Uh, I would assume that they are, yes. As the, as the ultimate owner of uh, Enbridge Quill Holdings. Because I noted that it's the agreement signed by Enbridge Quill Holdings and e EQ Holdings is the entity created to to uh, participate in the transaction from the Enbridge side, I understand that. I also, I think, I'm pretty clear that EQ Holdings is really just a, a corporate entity without any, any other function except for the facilitation of, of, the, of uh, the agreement and its execution, the merger agreement, I mean. Um, so that, that's what led to my question about Enbridge Inc. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'm glad for your understanding. I'll, I'll be seeking that from the Enbridge representative as well. Regarding the communication plan, um, for in, uh, informing customers of the of the uh, consummation of the merger and the change in ownership and the, the change in names and uh, the other things that would be attendant to. Uh, the transition, uh, it's my understanding that the plan doesn't yet fully exist, at least, and uh, that it, this will be something that will be developed in consultation with the division and the office. Is that correct? Yeah, we, 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 I, I would say I, I would agree with you with the exception. I would say we will probably develop the plan and then seek their feedback before we, we roll it out. Yes. Sure. Yeah. But you will receive their feedback. Absolutely, yes. And um, should there be any any uh, disagreement regarding the plan itself? Uh, would would how would you expect that to be resolved? Yeah, so I can tell you we've we've had experience with this, uh, with our Thermwise programs, with our Green Therm programs, with our Carbon Right programs, um, and usually, first of all, I, I I will say we really want and appreciate their feedback because uh, we we think it's it's valuable, um, and typically we've been able to work out any differences uh, amongst ourselves. So I, I guess I, I'm confident that that we'll be able to develop a plan that all the parties 
are comfortable with and supportive of. Regarding uh, commitment number 13, and in particular the services that uh, Dominion Energy will provide uh, to facilitate uh, at least a several month transition process, it, it, am I correct that for the first year after the merger closes, Dominion Energy will provide the services without any fee? Correct. And regarding the uh, uh, commitment at 13C, I'm reading this uh, to mean that uh, that Questar Gas would have, in effect, the I'm going to use a legal term, but you, I think you'll know what I mean. You'll, you'll, in effect, have the burden to prove that cost that you think ought to be included beyond the, uh, the, the benchmark of $125.89. Um, you'll have the burden to prove that those are not caused uh, by... Uh, any influence of the merger transaction. That's so. exact. That's exactly right. So to give you an example, let's say FEMSA comes out with a new rule that requires additional testing, and that causes our expenses to go up, and we can show that, you know, absent this additional cost that was required by law, we would be within. That, that's the kind of, of uh, evidence we would need to provide in order to get cost recovery above this, this cap level. Okay. Now, now, regarding Commitment 26 and the financial support that Questar Gas will receive, or it reads, Questar Gas will be supported with funding consistent with past practice. Um, this, my question relates a little bit to my initial question from Commitment 1. Who, what entity will provide the funding? Yeah, that might be a better or support. A better question for Mr. Johnston. He's uh, and I, I intend to ask him, but okay. I just wondered if you had an understanding of it uh, as well. And if you don't, that's uh, I understand. I, that's I, fine. Yeah, I, I, w I could probably make a guess, but I I would probably be more comfortable just letting him answer because he he knows for sure. Thank you. Those are all my questions. Thank you. Commissioner Harvey, any questions for Mr. Mendenhall? Yes. Can you hear me all right? All right. I have to do this double. <laughs> <laughs> Your neck's going to get tired. Indeed. All right. Um, I, I think I want to start with uh, DEU Enbridge Hearing Exhibit 14. Sure. And just a clarification of how you described the paragraph about the equity ratio? Yes. Um, my understanding is that our order reduced the leverage because we reduced your equity from a higher level down to 51. But in what you just said, I thought I heard was that they were increasing. Yeah, so maybe I can explain that. So. If I have an equity level of 55%, my debt level is 45%. If that gets reduced from 55 to 51%, my debt level goes from 45% up to 49%. So I'm more leveraged from a, a, debt, perspective. a debt perspective, which from a credit rating perspective, that they don't, they don't like that. <laughs> they don't like more leverage. Well, is it... That they don't like more leverage, or they just they see like more, a higher return on the equity. Well, yeah, or 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 yes, they, they see it as more risky. I guess I would say. I well, guess I wouldn't say they don't like it, but they they see it as creating more risk. Okay, thanks. Yep. All right. Um, I have some questions about the commitment matrix. Sure. Um, and this is somewhat redundant, but 
I just want to get a little more detail on that 13, the answer you gave to Commissioner Clark. Um, I thought the example that you gave about if there was a new regulation in place that that was a great example because it clarified the thinking. Uh, but my question would be, absent any structural change like that, we just have a general rise in costs, which seems sadly to be the thing that happens most of the time. How would uh, your company go about parsing that between transaction versus just it costs more? Yeah, so we did we did recognize, I'm glad you said that, because inflation is, is a thing now. It wasn't something we've been worried about before. Um, and so that is why we have adjusted that baseline cost per customer for uh, the, the CPI is to, to kind of capture that inflation. So in my mind, unless we could point to something that was unexpected or that, that was not, um, you know, outside of the corporate cost realm, mm -hmm. um, I think the burden of proof would be on us to explain why it was over that. Otherwise, uh, that would those costs would be disallowed. Okay, so it, all right. Um, and if this gets too far into negotiations, you can just say, I'm not going to answer. <laughs> <laughs> and feel free. Um, but I'm intrigued why you picked, or why collectively, thought you collectively, the CPI was picked. Um, there are a lot of indexes that actually relate to specific industries, like, and, or even just more of the wholesale economy. Like we use the GDP deflator, for instance, for the infrastructure tracker. Right. Because we tend to think that does a little bit better job of measuring the business's cost than the CPI. But any thoughts on the CPI? Yeah, so my memory is we did look at a number of factors. Some mm -hmm. were very favorable to the company, some mm -hmm. not so favorable to the company. And it, it felt, um, and I, I guess this is probably just my own personal opinion, but it felt to me like CPI was kind of a, a fair... Uh, a middle ground? It, it's, a, it's a fair middle ground and a... And a it's a factor that everybody's familiar with, every, a lot of people use, and so that, that's, from my standpoint, I can't speak for the other parties, but um, that's why I was comfortable using it, even though there were factors that were utility-specific that would have given us a little bigger bump. Um, I just felt like this was a, a fair uh, factor to use for all the parties involved. Thank you. Yep. All right, uh, moving to 17A on the commitment matrix. Um, it talks about the fund being dispersed to these various organizations. I'm just a bit curious about how the allocation between who gets how much is going to be done. Yeah, so that's a very good question. And my, my understanding, I mean, I'm not intimately... Uh, involved with it, but but I, I do I do think um, historically there's been kind of a proportional amount that goes to to various um, universities and colleges, um, and and I would imagine that 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 same proportion would be used as as those organizations receive their final final assets to to use. Thanks. Yep. Um, and then throughout the commitment matrix, and there's occasionally this idea of something will be done at shareholder cost. Um, is that what I could think of as a gift, meaning they're, the shareholder is just going to pony that money up and it is gone? Or is it something that goes into a is it simply an agreement to spend that much, but it goes into some type of a capital account that would earn a return? Yeah, no, it, it's it's the, the former. So it would basically just be a below-the-line expense that would never be seen or included in a rate case for okay. cost recovery purposes. Thanks. Yep. Uh, and then on the customer satisfaction standards, uh, the matrix says that they'll be updated 
Um, and then after that, there'll be reporting. Uh, do you anticipate those reports being filed with the commission, with the DPU? What, what's the anticipation there? Yeah, I, I think last time we filed them with the commission um, as part of the docket. Uh, if, if I remember correctly, I could be wrong, but I, I think that that would be my, my intent this go around. Uh, and then we would just copy the division and the office. But they'd be filed. They'd be the, filed with the commission, yeah, so the commission could see them. Okay. Um, and then on commitment 32, talking about possible bankruptcy stuff. Yes. Something, of course, hope never becomes yeah. an act. Oh, uh, uh, talking about the bankruptcy commitment, uh, something that we hope never becomes operational. Me <laughs> both. But uh, my question is just, given the financial reporting that the company has committed to, wouldn't we know long before a possible bankruptcy that there was an issue? Yes, you would. Unless you didn't look at the reports, you would know. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Okay. Very good. Um, and then a final financial reporting, well, two questions. Uh, one, it wasn't quite clear to me, and maybe it's, I'm misreading, but is the company committing to continue to file um, all of the financial reports that it currently is, you know, the quarterly, the annual, stuff with rate cases? Do you anticipate any changes in what's being filed? I, I do not, know. I, I would expect us to. So yes, we we file uh, financial statements monthly, um, and then obviously in rate cases and other proceedings, we file like results of operations. Yeah, I, I think we would continue to file all that information. That none of that should change. Okay. Uh, and then a final question on financial. Um, as the commission's technical staff uh, looks at works with those models. Um, they've identified to the commission, not to other parties, but to the commission, um, some things that uh, aren't quite the way they would have reported it, I guess. Not saying that the information's wrong, but just simply the way it's presented. That there might be some interdependencies that instead of showing those calculations, the, it's just the final result that's reported, things like that. Um, would the company be willing to uh, commit to working with both commission staff and uh, DPU and OCS to discuss some of those formatting presentation type issues? Sure. Are you talking about the results of operations or is there yeah, any specific? Well, primarily results of operations, but just in general, the some of the things that we view as being connected seem to be not be functionally connected in, oh, in the okay. models that are reported? Sure, yeah. We're, we're always willing to collaborate and take feedback. Okay. Uh, that's all the questions I have. Thank you. Thank you, Com Thank you Commissioner Harvey. Um, no questions for me. All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Mr. Mendenhall. Dominion Energy has no further witnesses to offer, but as I mentioned earlier, Mr. Cook is available should you have questions for him. Does the division anticipate any questions for Mr. Cook? The division does not anticipate any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Moore? You will have no questions. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Russell? No questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dominion Energy has nothing further. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Burnett, if you'd like to call your first witness, please. Average call, Holdings calls uh, Laszlo Barsani to the stand. Good morning. Do you swear to tell the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you very much, and thanks for checking your microphone. Please proceed, Council. Would you please state your name and business address for the record, please? Laszlo Varshanyi. I'm at 425 First Street Southwest in Calgary, Canada. By whom are you employed, and what is your position? 
Enbridge Gas, Inc., and I'm the Vice President of Regulatory Integration and Value Creation. Would you please provide us with a summary of your experience? Sure. Yeah, I've uh, been involved in the energy industry for roughly 30 years. Since 1998, I've been employed by Enbridge, Inc., or various of its affiliates, across a, a range of different um, departments or areas, uh, ranging from business development, commodity and uh, market fundamentals, asset performance, new ventures power, uh, mergers and acquisitions, as well as regulatory affairs and uh, capital competitiveness. Uh, prior to joining Enbridge, I was with the Department of Energy in Alberta, and there I was tasked with uh, formulating pricing, supply, and uh, demand forecasts. Uh, would you tell us about your educational background, please? Yes, I have a Bachelor of Arts in Economics from the University of Calgary and uh, a Master of Arts in Economics from Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. So what is the purpose of your testimony today? I'm here to testify in support of the transaction uh, that's contemplated in this docket between Questar Gas and EQ Holdings. And would you provide us some background about Enbridge? Yes, Enbridge is a very large and diversified energy company. And uh, I'll just highlight that we've got a very strong focus on natural gas. And crucially, it's a growing focus on natural gas. And that's because we follow the fundamentals. And the fundamentals to us points to an ongoing and critical need for natural gas in the energy mix going forward for a very long time. And, and that's why we're thrilled to have this opportunity to work with the Questar team and uh, participate in this community. Have you had the opportunity to participate in this proceeding? I have. I've been extensively involved in the preparation of the application itself, as well as towards the uh, technical conferences and conveying the benefits of the transaction. And then I've also led the uh, discussions um, with the division, the office, and the UAE to uh, reach agreement on the issues in this proceeding. And as a result of uh, those productive and candid discussions, the parties reached a stipulation which has been filed as part of this docket. And uh, we believe that it forms the basis of a long-term partnership with the parties uh, that will benefit Questar Gas's customers as, uh, as well as being in the public interest as a whole. Would you please discuss why the transaction is in the public interest? Yeah, well, we have the uh, financial, the managerial, and the technical expertise to operate the utility. And through its affiliation with Enbridge, Questar Gas will have access to the broader pool of uh, Enbridge um, family of companies. And Enbridge has the willingness, as well as the interest, to invest in the existing infrastructure of Questar Gas, but also to grow that infrastructure into new communities. And um, all, all that while ensuring the safe and reliable distribution of energy. And the transaction will also produce distinct net benefits for ratepayers. Would you describe the commitments and the stipulation at a high level? Sure. Well, M Mr. Mendenhall has just gone through that in some detail. I, I think really suffice to say that uh, if you step back and look at that, there's almost five dozen commitments there, including the subparts, 59 to be exact. And... Um, Maybe I'll have an opportunity to highlight just uh, a few of those and, and really um, underscore uh, why the transaction's in the public interest. How, how do you anticipate that Questar Gas will be managed? It will continue to operate as a uh, separate legal entity 
and uh, the headquarters will continue to be maintained for the foreseeable future here in Salt Lake City. Uh, Questor Gas will be locally managed by a team of uh, seasoned experts who have uh, deep re uh, knowledge and expertise in the retail distribution of natural gas. And, uh, but but um, Enbridge will have, or sorry, Questar Gas will have access to the much larger Enbridge family of companies. Will the transaction change how uh, the commission regulates Questar Gas? N no, it will not. Um, Questar Gas will remain subject to the commission's jurisdictions who will continue to regulate service quality and rates. Questar Gas will, of course, honor existing laws, rules, and regulation and tariff provisions. Senior officers and management will be made available to testify before this commission. The books and records will continue to be held in Salt Lake City, and uh, the division, the commission, and the OCS will have access to the relevant records. Would you please discuss some of the net benefits that, that, that will occur from the stipulation on the transaction. Yes, so maybe I'll, I'll preface it to say I'm not aware of any um, detriments associated with the transaction. And so maybe what I'll do is switch to the side of the ledger of the, the net benefits and, and really talk to some of the quantifiable ones that Mr. Mendenhall had touched upon. So there was some discussion about the disbursement of the $4 million uh, trust fund associated with University and Arts, as well as uh, the associated $175,000 increase uh, for a period of three years in uh, community investments for charitable contributions. And then there's the $225,000 that are promoting increased awareness of the Energy Assistance Fund to make sure that those that qualify for that are aware of its existence and maximize the probability that they'll be able to benefit from that. The $275,000 credit to the Infrastructure Replacement Tracker. And then the uh, agreement that Questar Gas will not propose any increase to the commission approved infrastructure replacement investment level for a period of uh, the next two general rate cases. And finally, the fifth one that I'll highlight is again for the period of the next two general rate cases to limit the increase um, in, in the per customer operating maintenance and GNA as inflated. Is the stipulation just, reasonable, and in the public interest? Yes, it is. The stipulation strengthens the existing commitments. It uh, addresses the issues and concerns that have been raised by the interveners. And it provides real and significant benefits to uh, the Questar Gas's customers. And based on my years of experience, both as an industry executive, but also as an economist, I conclude that it's just, reasonable, in the interest of the public, as well as uh, providing net benefits to customers. And I believe both the stipulation and the transaction should be approved. Does this conclude your testimony? Yes, it does. Uh, this witness is available for cross-examination and questions from the commission. Thank you very much. Uh, does the division have any questions for this witness? The division does not. Thank you. Thank you. And for the office? No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Russell, any questions on behalf of UAE? No questions. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Clark? Oh, good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> I believe you heard my question to Mr. Mendenhall regarding um, Commitment 1 and the relationship that Enbridge, Inc., um, the parent company of all the entities that have uh, been part of our discussion this morning, um, the, the relationship it has to the commitments that are before us in the 
stipulation and uh, their ongoing uh, uh, enforcement and operation. Can, can you help me understand uh, that a little better? I, I can certainly try, Commissioner. So although Enbridge Inc. is not a party to the stipulation, uh, it is the ultimate parent of EQ Holdings, and it does support EQ Holdings entering into the stipulation. And, and so can I understand from that, from uh, your testimony, that, that Enbridge Inc. is bound by the uh, commitments that are in the agreement? Well, EQ Holdings is bound by the commitments, and Enbridge Inc. will support EQ Holdings in adhering to those commitments. And so um, Mr. Johnston will speak to some of the financial support. Uh, there's also uh, technical managerial support that can be derived from the broader family of companies within the Enbridge Inc. family. So it will be uh, putting in its, Enbridge Inc. will be putting in its support uh, of EQ Holdings to be able to uh, uh, meet its obligations under the stipulation. Am I correct that going forward, EQ Holdings won't be capitalized in 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 some fashion that, uh, to provide the support directly to uh, uh, Questar? Well, yes, it, is it? EQ Holdings is, as, as the name suggests, a holding company, and so it has no staff and, and no operations, but uh, yeah. it, it's a hold co. And so there would be in Enbridge Inc. that would that would be, or some other entity in that family of companies that would be supporting the commitments that are part of the uh, that are expressed in the stipulation that's before us related to the acquisition we're talking about. Well, well, some of them, uh, Questar Gas itself, uh, can meet. You know, in terms of uh, not applying for. Uh, uh, an increase in in a um, in, in a rider that it's agreed not to uh, apply for an increase and, and that sort of thing, but uh, and it does raise its own debt on occasion, and so certain of the obligations can be met directly, and and those that uh, require support, it will be somewhere up the chain, uh, all all the way up to the ultimate parent of Enbridge Inc. as necessary in order to uh, to garner that support. So re regarding uh, 1B in particular, I'm anticipating that at, at some point in the future, um, Questar Gas will, will be located differently in the organizational structure of Enbridge, Inc. than, than it will be initially. And um, that can happen under the agreement um, as an internal reorganization that, that would not uh, be a change of control and, and therefore would not implicate, I assume, uh, our, our jurisdiction. And, and so my, my, with that uh, background or understanding, my question really is, uh, in this area is trying to get at the heart of of this, the uh, circumstance in the future where Questar Gas sits somewhere else in the Enbridge Inc. organization, and EQ Holdings is no longer involved in its in it structurally. So, where do the what happens to the commitments that are made here in under the, those conditions? Who's bound to abide them from the Enbridge side of, of, of uh, this acquisition? I, I think I understand the, uh, the concern underlying the, the question. And maybe let me preface it by the fact that I'm not aware of any intent to change the structure uh, post-transaction in terms of the... Um, the uh, the, the ownership structure that went through that we went through during the technical conference, 
Now, that being said, uh, you're, you're correct, Commissioner, that there's certain transactions that could be done without triggering a, uh, a requirement for an approval. But uh, under such a circumstance, the, any of the contracts, obligations, um, stipulations that EQ Holdings have entered into and are bound by, the, those would go with the, uh, with the entity. And so to the extent that it's moved um, elsewhere within the Enbridge family, the stipulation provisions continue to bind the, uh, the company. And by the company uh, that you're referring to, Enbridge Inc.? I I'm referring to Questar Gas, EQ Holdings, you know, to the extent that it's owned by somebody else within the chain of Enbridge. EQ Holdings as an entity would uh, would continue to be bound to the extent that that it were collapsed. Um, that's not a, a an opportunity for us to get out from underneath the uh, the stipulation. Regarding uh, separate subject now regarding uh, commitment twenty four. say separate but it, it, it is related um, here we have e EQ Holdings committing to support the financial strength and integrity of Questar Gas uh, including <coughs> ensuring that Questar Gas has access to the resources funding and credit needed to support its operations and growth uh, if EQ Holdings uh, cease to exist or if uh, Questar Gas is transferred to the ownership of some other entity in the family, um, I think what I'm hearing you say is these commitments would, would be assumed by the new uh, parent of uh, Questar Gas. Is that, is that correct? That's correct, Commissioner. Okay. And then with regard to establishing and implementing the ring fencing structures, I, I have the sense from this language there, those structures are not fully defined yet. Is that correct? Uh, I, I think that they're uh, well understood by the parties in, in terms of the structures that are being put in place. You know, having it as a separate entity is, is a key one, a separate legal entity. And... Uh, making sure that uh, the th this utility and all of the other utilities are separated from the broader uh, operations of Enbridge Inc. And to, um, to, to the extent that there's uh, deeper questions related to that topic, Mr. Johnston is uh, uh, available to, to respond to those. What I want to assure um, at this stage is that whatever they are, as they're established and implemented, um, that they will, they'll be part of the integration progress reports that we receive so that we can understand uh, beyond what's, beyond the commitments that are expressed here, so that we can understand the nature and, and, um, force of those uh, ring fencing um, uh, requirements or uh, uh, pr processes. Is that, I, would I, they I, be part of the in integration report as far as you understand it? I have no concerns making them part of that report. Okay. Those are all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner Clark. Uh, Commissioner Harvey, questions for this witness? Uh, just a few. Um, and really, primarily just a clarification uh, from what you've answered to Commissioner Clark. 
Um, the sense that I'm getting is that the holding company, no staff, is, is primarily a legal instrument to facilitate this transaction. Uh, a legal instrument to facilitate the transaction, but also to facilitate the ring fencing and the separation from uh, from the ownership and, and control, and and to isolate it from the other operations of the broader parent. Okay, that that's helpful to me. Um, so, in any of the commitments that talk about the Enbridge family, well, I, well, I guess they just refer to the hold call uh, providing resources, particularly financial resources, if needed. Um, by definition, it would have to come from some entity beyond the hold code, because the hold code doesn't have any of its own, right? Yes. And the um, and that that would just be determined by some type of an Enbridge corporate level decision as to where it makes sense to for that to come from. Yeah, they'll optimize uh, in the Treasury Department to to goal seek for least cost, you know, where to raise the debt, to, um, to, to seek for least cost, and, uh, you know, whether it's a debt raise that we're, that we're contemplating or, or whatever the case may be. Okay, thanks. Um, and then this is going back to a question that I asked Mr. Mendenhall but about the debt equity ratios. Uh, Within the Enbridge family of corporations, do, is there uh, targets that they typically like to see for their various companies in terms of debt equity ratios? Yeah, they vary by jurisdiction and uh, what the uh, form of uh, regulation is associated with that entity. And so different um, types of uh, Operations have different target uh, capitalization. Okay. Oh, and, and I apologize because I should remember this, but I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> Just how many utility customers are there prior to this these acquisitions within the Enbridge family? I want to say in the order of uh, three and a half million connections. Okay. All right. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I have no questions. Thank you. Thank you. We have nothing further on this witness. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Barshoni, you're, you're excused. We, we would ask if we could have a quick recess for uh, five minutes at sure. this point. Everyone, let's, uh, let's reconvene at, uh, let's make it 25 after, okay? So 10 minutes. Thank you.
at the break, um, EQ Holdings had just concluded uh, with a witness. Uh, Mr. Burnett, is, do you have another witness? Yes, uh, we, EQ Holdings calls Christopher Johnston to the stand. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Johnston. Hello. Do you swear to tell the truth? Yes. Thank you very much. Please proceed. Thank you. All right. Would you please state your name and business address for the record? Christopher James Johnston, CJ, uh, 425 First Street, Southwest Calgary, Alberta. And by whom are you employed? Ember Jink. And what is your position there? Vice President, Finance, Integration. Okay. Um, first, I want to turn to DEU Enbridge hearing exhibit number 13, which I believe you have a copy of in front of you. Uh, would you discuss, discuss briefly what this is and, and some of the implications of that? Sure, yeah, I can go into uh, lucky number 13. Um, this is the Moody's report. It was issued March 29th, and it's a downgrade report for Enbridge Inc. Downgrade just one notch from BAA1 to BAA2. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a few other things emphasized in that report. Uh, no change in our short-term ratings. No change, uh, there's no change noted in there for uh, specific to Questar. Uh, it's just specific to Enbridge, Inc. And, um, you know, when I was here in uh, early December at the technical conference, we, we discussed uh, Moody's having us on negative, uh, negative outlook. And at that time, I mentioned that they had changed their goalposts to add a new, a new measure, uh, being a dividend coverage ratio uh, metric, which they wanted us to, to follow. Um, I, I, I don't agree with their determination that depreciation expense, which is non-cash, should be treated as a cash expense in the calculation of a distribution coverage. Um, but they are allowed to have their independent view, and, and that is fine. Um, we are not in a short-term position to change our dividends such to uh, meet their metrics. And, uh, and as a result, uh, the, uh, the negative outlook has been removed, but we've been given the, the, one, uh, the one notch uh, downgrade. Um, so that's sort of the, the events that have occurred. In terms of how Enbridge views this, I mean, there certainly are some facts we can, we can point to. Uh, no change in the short-term uh, short rates. Our equity market didn't react, albeit this was issued on a, a holiday Friday, but on, on, the, on the Monday or the Tuesday, the, the equity markets didn't have a, a significant negative reaction. Uh, I think most importantly is, you know, we're a strong credit rating still. On April 2nd, we priced uh, US 3.5 billion of medium-term notes, and uh, it was four times oversubscribed, so there's still a, a significant demand for, for, for Enbridge to be, to be issuing debt. And as a result, we don't see this having a, a, negative, uh, a negative impact on, on Enbridging. So in, in, in summary, you, you feel like it's a strong company, really un, un, impacted by this? Yeah, well, it's situation. still a strong company. I mean, it was, it's disappointing. Um, sorry. Not impacted by this report. We, we don't see this changing our, our access to debt or at the favorable rates that we receive. I mean, it's still disappointing. There are still three other rating agencies that have us as triple B plus. We're still a strong investment rating company. Okay, thank you. Um, you were, you've been in the hearing room today, correct? And you heard a, a, a couple of questions from Commissioner Clark. Uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, uh, he, he chatted about um, uh, Ambridge Inc. and, and its relationship to the stipulation. Would you chat a little bit about it, uh, discuss that? Yes, uh, hopefully I can add some more color. I mean, Enbridge Quail is, is a party to the, the stipulation. A any successor corporation would be, or entity would be bound by those commitments. From an Enbridge Inc. perspective, we, we stand behind and support those commitments. One of the commitments, you know, with respect to, you know, how, how we, how we, at what rate we charge your debt, I, as an Enbridge Inc., uh, officer, I'm not in a position to circumvent that and, and have Enbridge Inc. do something differently. We, we, we stand behind the commitments we're making. So I think it's as simple as that. And uh, financially, there was a question regarding how this is, how would the commitments be funded? Sure. I mean, it's, uh, I had a lot of fun with the, the very long legal structure last time I was here. Um, you know, there's reasons why those structures are in place in terms of uh, ring fencing from the other LDCs, from other operations in Enbridge. 
but our commercial, pre commercial paper program is administered by Enbridge US. It is a hold co, and it does sit above um, Enbridge General Holdings, which sits above Enbridge Quail Holdings, but Enbridge US is our hold co um, that holds almost all of our US investments uh, across Enbridge for the most part, not all of them. Um, and it administers commercial paper. Uh, it has no operations. It is, uh, it is uh, guaranteed supported by Enbridge Inc. Um, for that uh, investment grade rating at Enbridge US, so Enbridge supports that, and uh, it raises commercial paper, and, and that's currently the mechanism where we'd be providing short-term uh, funding to uh, to Questar, um, albeit Questar will continue to issue its lo its long-term debt as it matures. So, is in summary, is Enbridge Inc. committed to the? stipulation provisions that EQ Holdings is entered into? We are committed to support to them. Yes, we support them. Okay. I have nothing for, further from this witness. Thank you very much. Does the division have any questions for this witness? No questions. Thank you. Thank you. And for the office? No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Russell, any questions for this witness? No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Clark, any questions for this witness? No, I have I have no questions. Thank you for your testimony and uh, for reinforcing the understanding that I hope to gain from my questions. The structure is elaborate. I, I recognize that's common, and I recognize the the purposes. But I'm I'm uh, appreciative of the clarification for our specific record that Enbridge Inc. is, is uh, committed to the stipulation and its various uh, provisions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Harvey. Uh, no questions, just thanks for the commitment and clarification. Welcome. Thank you. And, <clears throat> sir, I have no questions for you. You may step down. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we, we have no further witnesses, although we do. Uh, James Sanders is here today, could answer questions, as I mentioned previously. Michelle Herodence is uh, available for questions by telephone if you have any questions for them. Well, let me just quickly inquire. Does the division anticipate any questions for the witnesses that are available by telephone that were just mentioned? The division does not. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Moore for the office? The office is no questions. Okay. And Mr. Russell? No questions. No Thanks. questions. Okay. Thank you. No questions for them. No. Then uh, we have no further uh, witnesses today. Thank you very much. Why don't we move over to the division then? Thank you. The division calls as its witness, Mr. Eric Orton. May he please be sworn. Certainly. Good morning, Mr. Orton. Do you swear to tell the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Please proceed. Could you please state and spell your full name for the record? My name is Eric Orton, E-R-I-C-O-R-T-O-N. By whom are you employed and what is your title? I am employed by the Utah Division of Public Utilities. I'm a utility technical consultant. Your business address, please? 160 East, 300 South, Salt Lake City. Have you participated on behalf of the division in this docket, including participating in settlement discussions and the preparation of the settlement agreement? Yes. Did you prepare and cause to be filed what has been pre-marked as DPU Exhibit 2.0, which is your direct testimony filed on February 5th of 2024? Yes. Pursuant to paragraph 3 of the general portion of the stipulation, the division moves for the admission of Mr. Orton's testimony. Thank you very much. Uh, office, any? No objection. Um, start with Ms. Clark. Thank you. Dominion Energy has no objection. Okay.
Quail Holdings? No objections. Mr. Russell? No objections. Okay. Your motion is granted. Thank you. What is the purpose of your testimony here this morning? My purpose is to uh, illuminate the support of the division for the settlement stipulation. Thank you. Do you have a statement in support of the division's position that you would like to present? I do. Please proceed. Thank you. The company has provided a sufficient overview of the proposed stipulation and has explained the specific provisions and commitments that have been included, so I will not try to attempt them to repeat them at this point. Having said that, the purpose of my testimony today is to affirm the division's support of the proposed stipulation and explain the reasons behind our support. The division's an anal analysis in its pre-filed testimony revealed that there were certain parts of the acquisition commitments that were inadequate to hold ratepayers harmless and provide them with at least some net positive benefit. For example, the proposed merger commitments didn't sufficiently insulate the utilities customers from the actions and liabilities of its proposed new corporate parent. Additionally, the original application did not provide sufficient quantifiable net positive benefits to Questar Gas customers. The division's direct testimony recommended that the commission approve the application only if additional commitments could be uh, obtained and the merger provided a net benefit for customers. Since our direct testimony was filed, the division has participated in settlement discussions with representatives from Questar, Enbridge, uh, i.e. Fall West, Holdco, and other intervening parties to come to a resolution that strengthened the merger commitments and obtain some quantifiable net benefits to ratepayers. The division's, an, division's initial concerns about the application and proposed merger commitments have been sufficiently diminished by the inclusion of additional and more specific merger commitments contained in the negotiated stipulation. Additionally, the merger increases the likelihood of a well-run local utility while uh, establishing adequate protections and a net positive benefit for Utah customers. While I won't address every issue, I do need to address some of the sp specific items or areas of concern that were raised in the division's direct testimony and how these issues have been addressed in the commitments included in the settlement stipulation. There are 10 of these. Number one, division testimony recommended that any change of control or change of ownership of the utility will not be transferred out of the Enbridge umbrella without first receiving commission approval. We didn't want any surprises in this area. This was sufficiently addressed in commitment number 1B of the commitment matrix. Number two, division testimony recommended that the headquarters of the utility will stay within the state but not be required to remain at its current location. This provides the freedom the company should have to choose a location that would best be in the interest of shareholders, Enbridge, and the customers, the captive rate payers. Commitment number two addresses this concern by committing to maintaining the utility's headquarters in the Salt Lake City area for the foreseeable future. Number three, division testimony rec recommended that the O&M cost per customer should not be increased above the current levels for, for a specific time. This is sufficiently addressed in commitment number 13C. Number four, division testimony recommended that details of the steps, sequences, and milestones in the process of the change of ownership from Dominion to Enbridge 
should be provided to regulators on a periodic basis. This is sufficiently addressed in commitment number eight, which requires a communication plan, and commitment number 36, which establishes the integration progress reporting requirements. Number five, division testimony recommended that the applicant should provide a clear statement that the customers of the utility will bear no, resp no responsibility to cover any costs associated with the transfer of ownership of the utility. This was sufficiently addressed in commitments numbers 9A, 10, 11, 12B, and 13. The division recommended, this is number six, that a capital structure range should be spe specified, excuse me, to provide a tangible number for regulators to monitor. This is sufficiently addressed in commitment number 30, which specifies a capital structure range between 48% and 50%. Number seven, the division recommended in testimony that the commission and other regulators should be notified if the bankruptcy director is called upon to exercise its responsibility. This is sufficiently addressed in commitment number 31. Number eight, division testimony recommended that the clean energy merger commitment be delineated. This was sufficiently addressed in commitment number 35. Number nine, the division's testimony discussed the importance of ring fencing. And while not all possible ring fencing provisions addressed by division witness Mr. Coleman have been included in this stipulation, the division is satisfied that the included conditions provide adequate protection for customers from credit risks or exposures of the utility's parent or sister companies. This is sufficiently addressed in commitment numbers 24 through 32. Number 10, division testimony discussed the importance of a net benefit being realized by ratepayers. This is sufficiently addressed, at least in part, by commitment numbers 9C2, 17A, and B. Finally, the division would like to address Moody's downgrade of Enbridge, Inc.'s credit rating, which has occurred after the division filed its direct testimony and after the settlement stipulation was filed. On March 29, 2024, Moody's issued a report downgrading the senior unsecured ratings of Enbridge, Inc. and its subsidiaries, reflecting what it called the ongoing weakness of the company's financial profile. Moody's also stated that as Enbridge moves forward with several utility acquisitions, the company will have low levels of financial flexibility and higher leverage, which they say should expect to remain that way for several years. In other words, by buying these utilities, Enbridge will have less money than it would otherwise have had to invest in opportunities that may uh, appear. This is not surprising nor unnerving to the division. Moody's also stated in that report that the three LDC utility acquisitions will modestly strengthen the company's business profile risk touting Enbridge's large size scale and its diverse low-risk asset base, which will continue to generate stable cash flow in their opinions. It stated that Enbridge's business risk position compares favorably to industrial peers and is supported by its ownership of an extensive crude oil and gas network, including, including a growing gas distribution segment that is unique to the midstream sector. The division has examined those reports, which are now called, I believe, Exhibits 13 and 14, and the ramifications. We've discussed them internally and with company personnel. This is not, these reports have not caused the division to alter its support of the stipulation. In summary, the division has examined and analyze the proposed acquisition and participated in discussions and settlement negotiations. These activities have led the division to its position supporting the stipulation. 
Therefore, with the additional terms and commitments identified in this stipulation and the attached Exhibit A, the division is satisfied that Enbridge and Questar Gas have demonstrated a net benefit to customers and that the requested acquisition is in the public interest. The division recommends the commission approve the acquisition of Questar Corporation by Enbridge, also known as Fall West Hold Co. and EQ Holdings, under the terms set forth in the settlement stipulation and attached matrix. It is the division's position that the stipulation taken in whole provides benefit to ratepayers and is in the public interest. That concludes my statement. Thank you. Thank you. I have just a couple of things I would like to clarify. Mm -hmm. In your summary and in your statement of support, you mentioned DEU Enbridge Hearing Exhibit 13.0, which is the Moody's report on Enbridge, and DEU Enbridge Hearing Exhibit 14.0, which is the Moody's rating report on Questar Gas Company. To clarify, has the division not only reviewed and discussed and analyzed Exhibit 13, but has the division done the same with regard to Exhibit 14? We have. And Exhibit 14 and Exhibit 13 do not change the division's recommendation. Is that right? That's correct. Is it also your testimony that the proposed settlement is just and reasonable? It is. With that, Mr. Orton is available for questions by the parties and by the commission and the hearing and the judge. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Moore, any questions for this witness? No questions, thank you. Okay. Mr. Russell, questions for this witness? No questions, thank you. Mr. Burnett, do you have questions for this witness? No questions. Okay. Ms. Clark? I have one clarifying question. Please. Good morning, Mr. Good morning. Orton. Uh, I, I thank you for your testimony, and I would just like to quickly reference number six on your list of concerns that had been resolved by the stipulation. Yes. And, and my question for you is this. I wanted to make sure our record was clear. Um, would you agree that that commitment indicates that Questar's practice of setting its dividend rates at levels that maintain Questar's capital structure between 48% and 55%. Is that is that a fair and correct statement? That's true. And and given that commitment, that resolved the division's concern about capital structure. That's true. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Clark. Good morning, Mr. Orton. I, I have a couple of questions for you. Great. First, um, Regarding the communication plan that's going to be developed and that um, you'll have an oppor you, the division will have an opportunity to review and, and uh, provide feedback uh, regarding that plan. Um, I, I'm sure the division's as concerned as the commission is that if the transaction goes forward, that it that the communications be as carefully prepared and rolled out as possible, so that there's the least amount of uh, uh, concern uh, on the part of customers. Uh, so, uh, can I have your commitment that if 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 there's anything that's material that the division has a concern with that you'll bring that to the commission quickly so that we can help in the resolution of that uh, uh, disagreement. We will do that in earnest. Yes, you okay. have our commitment. And uh, regarding the integration progress report, mm -hmm. um, the, the phrasing of the the ring fencing uh, discussion in Commitment 24 uh, regarding the establishment and implementation of mm -hmm. ring fencing structures just leads me to conclude that, that perhaps that work is not entirely final, but we do see ring fencing elements 
in the commitments. Um, so so what, what I'm asking the division for is, is uh, a commitment to include in the integration progress report any changes to the ring fencing elements that are described in the stipulation or elaborations on those so that the commission can remain fully apprised of uh, uh, the ring fencing structures that are put into place. We'll make sure that happens. Thank you, Mr. Orton. Those are all my uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Clark. Commissioner Harvey, questions for Mr. Orton? Yes, just a few about the DEU Enbridge hearing exhibit 13. Mm -hmm. um, and, well, and actually, before my question, uh, just uh, thank you for going through that list of, that compared the division's direct testimony to the resolution of those points. It got rid of the vast majority of my questions. So that's great. <laughs> it is good. <laughs> so very happy for that. So thank you. Uh, but my question, uh, with respect to a Moody's rating, in your opinion, who is the, the primary target market that Moody's is preparing material for? The, my understanding is those who invest in the bond or the stock market. Um, okay. And then um, with the interest of rate payers, specifically Utah rate payers of Questar Gas, <laughs> necessarily align with the interests of generic bond and stock uh, investors within the broader economy? No. In fact, they may be opposed to each other. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's all my questions. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> Thank you. And I have no questions for you. So all righty. You may be excused. Thank you. Mr. Casey Coleman of the division prepared and caused to be filed what's been marked as DPU Exhibit 1.0 direct with its Exhibit 1.1. As previously noted, Mr. Coleman is available by telephone today because he's out of state at a work-related conference. Consistent with paragraph three of this settlement's general terms and conditions, the division would like to move for the admission of DPU Exhibit 1.0 DIR with its one Point one exhibit, those being filed by Mr. Coleman. Thank you very much. Mr. Moore, any objection to the motion? No objection. Mr. Russell, objection to the motion? No objection. Thank you. Mr. Burnett, how do you respond? No objection. Okay, Ms. Clark? Also no objection. Okay, your motion is granted. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Coleman is available by telephone if there are cross-examination questions for him or questions from the commissioner. Please let me know if you would like me to call him. Thank you. Why don't we just ask quickly, Mr. Moore, will you have any questions for Mr. Coleman? No questions, Coleman? thank you. Mr. Russell? No questions, thanks. Okay. Mr. Burnett, any questions for Mr. Coleman? No questions. Coleman? None here either. Okay. And thanks. None for me and none from up here, so no questions. Thank you. The division has nothing further. May I, may I approach the witness stand and just remove that binder, give our next witness a little more space? Sure. Thank you. Why don't we go to the Office of Consumer Services? Yes, the Office of Consumer Services calls Jacob Zachary to the stand and asks that he be sworn. Hello, Mr. Zachary. Do you, uh, will you tell the truth here today? Hello, and yes, I will. Thank you. Please proceed, Mr. Moore. Can you please state and spell your name for the record? Yes, I'm um, sorry. Jacob Zachary, J-A-C-O-B-Z-A-C-H-A-R-Y. What is your business address and how are you employed? 
My business address is 160 East, 300 South, Salt Lake City, Utah, and I am a utility analyst for the Office of Consumer Services. In your capacity as utility analyst, have you reviewed the findings in this document? Yes. Did you prepare and cause to be filed direct testimony in this docket on February 5th, 2024? Yes, I did. Do you have any changes you'd like to make to this testimony now? No. If I asked you the same questions that are contained in your pre-filed testimony, would your answers be the same? Yes. At this point, pursuant to uh, paragraph three of the general provisions of the stipulation, the office would move for the admission of uh, Mr. Zachary's direct testimony. Thank you. Um, I'll just go this way. M Ms. Schmidt, how would you respond? No objection. Thank you. Ms. Clark? No objection. Mr. Burnett? No objection. And Mr. Russell, how would you respond? No objection. Okay, thank you. Your motion is granted. Did you participate in the negotiations that led to the settlement stipulation that is the subject of this hearing? Yes, I did. Have you, have you reviewed the final version of the settlement stipulation? Yes. Have you prepared a statement summarizing the OCS's position on the settlement stipulation? Yes, I have. Please proceed. The settlement stipulation before the commission today requests approval for the proposed sale of Questar Gas Company through Fallless Holdco LLC to Enbridge Quail Holdings LLC. As part of my participation in this docket on behalf of the OCS, I reviewed the documents that have been filed in this docket read previous orders by the commission, other relevant dockets, filed direct testimony, and participated in discussions that led to the stipulation being considered by the commission today. I am here today to support the settlement. In direct testimony filed on February 5th, I acknowledge that the joint applicants initially committed to some explicit benefits and many financial protections, but I also identified some risks. Thus, I concluded that at that time, it was not clear that there would be enough ratepayer benefit to outweigh the potential costs and risks of Enbridge acquiring Questar Gas. The settlement contains additional specific ratepayer benefits, addresses many of my initial concerns, and in totality, now provides a net benefit to ratepayers. The OCS believes that this settlement stipulation is just and reasonable in result and in the public interest. The OCS recommends that the Commission approve it. That concludes my summary. Thank you. Mr. Zachary is available for cross and questions from the commission and the hearing officer. Thank you. Mr. Schmidt, any questions for Mr. Zachary? No questions, thank you. Mr. Russell, any questions for Mr. Zachary? No questions, thank you. Mr. Burnett, how about questions for you? No questions. Okay. And Ms. Clark? No questions, thanks so much. Thank you. Commissioner Clark. <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Zachary. Good morning. Uh, I believe you were here uh, during my brief questioning of Mr. Orton, mm -hmm. and um, my question to you will be basically the same as the question I addressed to him regarding the communication plan. I see from Commitment 8 that the office is uh, going to be part of the uh, team that will review uh, uh, the, the plan that... Uh, that is proposed, uh, and I just uh, I'm looking for the same commitment from the office that to, if you're concerned about any material part of it, that it will not adequately inform customers or will somehow uh, mislead customers uh, concerning the nature of the acquisition that you will promptly uh, uh, raise that with the commission so that we can assist yes, in I, the development of the plan. Yes, I absolutely can commit to that. Thank you very much. And we appreciate both. I, I want to say the, the division and the office's uh, careful work and, uh, and all of the parties. Um, I'm sure it was a difficult, challenging process to reach this settlement. At some point in this hearing, I just wanted to express appreciation for the efforts that uh, all have made. And uh, was, that concludes my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Clark. Commissioner Harvey, questions for Mr. Zachary? Uh, just a, one or two. Um, 
and again, I'm not trying to delve into either the negotiations or your uh, personal weighing of costs and benefits or anything, but uh, I'd just like you to very briefly say what you view the, the biggest benefits of the acquisition uh, on the part of the, the biggest, the biggest benefits that will flow to Utah ratepayers, in your opinion. Well, in my, uh, my testimony, my filed testimony, I identified a handful of concerns that we believe kind of cumulatively, if we could get those addressed or have the company, the joint applicants, um, try to improve those in some way that we would, you know, that starts to, I guess, weigh the scale towards that net benefit argument that we have been arguing for. Um, and we believe kind of cumulatively as all of the stipulations, all of the commitments contained in the stipulation add up to where we do believe that that net benefit exists by outweighing any risks that we believe also exist. So as, as far as the um, you know, specific benefits, it's uh, honestly, I don't feel comfortable just pointing to one benefit to say that's really what tipped it, um, to say it was that or nothing, but we believe the entire package presented in the settlement has outweighed, uh, has caused more benefit than those potential risks. Thank you. Thank you. And I have no questions for you, so you may step down. Thank you. Anything further from the office, Mr. Moore? The office is nothing further. Thank you. Thank you very much. For the Utah Association of Energy Users. Yes, thank you. UAE calls Kevin Higgins to the stand. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Higgins. Do you, tell, do you swear to tell the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Good morning, Mr. Higgins. Could you state and spell your name for the record, please? My name is Kevin C. Higgins, K-E-V-I-N, middle initial C, H-I-G-G-I-N-S. And could you tell us who you work for? I'm a principal in the firm Energy Strategies. And on whose behalf do you offer testimony in this proceeding? I'm here on behalf of the UAE Intervention Group. And did you prepare and cause to be filed direct testimony in this proceeding uh, marked UAE Exhibit 1? Yes, I did. And with respect to that testimony, do you have any corrections to make? I do not. If you were asked the same questions today that are posed in that pre-filed testimony, would, you, would your answers be the same? Yes, they would, uh, prior to the uh, filing of the uh, settlement stipulation. Sure, sure, we'll get to that. And, and at this point, I'll move for the admission of Mr. Higgins' direct testimony. For the division, any, any objection? No objection. Mr. Moore, any objection? No objection. Ms. Clark, any objection? No, thank you. Mr. Burnett, any objection? No objection. Mr. Russell, your motion is granted. Thank you. Mr. Higgins, after you submitted your testimony, did the parties to this docket enter into settlement discussions and reach a resolution? Yes. Um, and have you had an opportunity to review that stipulation? Yes, I have. And does it capture the resolution reached by the parties? Yes, it does. Uh, UAE is a party to the stipulation. Um, do you support it? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, at this point, I will ask you to provide a summary of your testimony and, and your thoughts about the stipulation, if you, if you have one. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, UAE supports the settlement stipulation as being in the public interest. Uh, in my direct testimony, I identified several issues that I found either were not present or apparent in the initial application relating to ratepayer protections, as well as concerns about net benefits. Um, in reaching a settlement uh, stipulation, uh, I've concluded that the entire package 
reasonably addresses the issues and concerns that I had raised. I would, I would point specifically to uh, in, in um, uh, Exhibit A, um, provision 11, 16, 12B, 15B, and 9C as addressing the specific issues I raised in my direct testimony. That, that concludes my summary. Thank you. Mr. Higgins is available for cross-examination and commission questions. Thank you very much. Does the division have questions for Mr. Higgins? No, thank you. Thank you. For, for the office, Mr. Moore? No questions, thank you. Okay. Mr. Burnett, any questions for this witness? Well, I've waited years to cross this witness, uh, so I've got, about, <laughs> I've got about 55 minutes worth of questions. I think. Um, usually he's my witness. So. Uh, I have no questions. Okay, thank you. Ms. Clark. I also have no questions. Thank you. Commissioner Clark. Uh, I have no questions, but thank you, Mr. Higgins, for your participation in, and uh, today, but also in the process that led to the settlement stipulation. My pleasure. Commissioner Harvey. Uh, no questions, but thank you. Thank you. And I don't have any questions either, and I must thank you, too. <laughs> you may step down. Nothing further from UAE. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, well, let me confer with the commissioners for a moment before we adjourn. Okay, before we uh, adjourn until this evening, um, we all agree that we didn't get a motion to admit into evidence the actual settlement stipulation, unless we're all confused. I don't believe you're confused, and I would so move. <laughs> Thank you. Any objection to that motion? Hearing, seeing, none. That motion is granted. Okay, does anybody have anything else before we adjourn? Okay, I'll remind everybody uh, we will reconvene for a public witness hearing tonight at 5 p.m. in this room. Thank you very much for everybody's time and preparation, and we'll see you later. We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.